Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to uh, Avila Day. And uh, for our next feature here, I'm uh, going to be interviewing one of the people who helped get me into Avila in the first place, and that is uh, Philosophicat. Have I said it right this time? Uh, yes, and I guess in order for me to say anything, I need to unmute. Uh, so you did <laughs> say it right. Congratulations. So uh, I'm going to ask you the first question, which is, how did you become interested in Evola? What what grew you to him? Uh, well, initially, I was interested um, because I was introduced to Evola by a friend who was really encouraging, um, even a bit pushy that I should read these books. But, uh, you know, once I got into them, uh, what kept me hooked, I would say, was my discontent with the modern world you know everything in this clown world is upside down and inverted from the normal order and i think many people feel that something isn't right even if they don't understand why um i think evola presents a really good analysis of the problems of the modern world and he contrasts them with what he calls the world of tradition and mm -hmm. i also think there were things in history that had been lost uh, I don't mean recent history, but primordial history that precedes even what we would now call antiquity. You know, uh, for example, when I was younger, I, I had this interest in ancient Egypt and I just learned everything I could about it as a kid. And I eventually lost interest as I got older because, um, you know, the way modern academics, the way they explain it is so unsatisfactory. But then that interest has been renewed since reading Evola because now I have this metaphysical framework in which to you know, understand the ancient Egyptians that modern academics not only can't provide, but would probably be openly hostile to. So he's kind of been able to show me a different and more interesting side of this thing that I was so interested in, you know, as a, as a preteen. And he, mm -hmm. he gives this sense that his, his scope of vision is so much bigger than modern conceptions of, of linear history. It's this sweeping panoramic view of all human history, piecing together the mysteries of our origins, and that made me really interested in him. His, his broad perspective and his deeper vision was so much more than any other philosopher or historian I'd ever read before, or in some cases, I guess, deepened my understanding of ancient philosophies by putting them in proper context. You know, for example, uh, I read Plato in university, which I liked at the time, um, but the interpretation given by the professors I had, it was just, it was so basic and shallow. And now with a foundation in the world of tradition, I can so much more clearly understand what Plato was really getting at. So there's this metaphysical layer to it that just goes far deeper. And that's something I really appreciate about Evola. Yeah. Uh, one thing that struck me is um, as I've been kind of going through all the stuff in preparation for, for today and reading back over some of the things as well is, um, is just how much, uh, how can I say like, his analysis also has predictive power, considering that he was writing in the in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and now we're in 2021. And it's like the tra trajectory that he was talking about has only got worse. Like we are, we're like as bad as things were in his time. I mean, there's there's a passage where he's complaining about uh, women wearing jeans at one point. And I'm like, if, you, if only you could see, you know, if only you could stand here now and see, you know, the state of things today but i don't think he'd be surprised. what would he say about yoga pants i wonder <laughs> but i i don't think he'd be surprised do you i think he would have said yeah this no is the no i don't think he would be been talking about because his point of view is basically that you know we're on this downward trajectory and we can't reverse it we just have to wait for it to run its cycle and then rebuild from the rubble so you know he's not i don't see him as being a person who would be shocked by any of the developments today he'd just probably be sitting back saying well i told you so um, because he never had this optimistic view that it was going to reverse itself. Yeah, I, I, I'm also struck uh, as well by some of the, you know, uh, the myopia of the modern scholars that you're talking about who almost act as a barrier to you reconnecting with the past in anything in any meaningful yes. way. And um, as I was, go I was going back over Men Among the Ruins, and he has this... Um, this footnote to Pareto when he's talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the feudal system. 
And um, this is a quotation from Pareto, but I think it's, I think it's something that people should bear in, in mind when they think about the past. He, he says, um, Pareto remarks, it is ridiculous to think that the ancient feudal system was imposed in Europe through brute force. It was partially upheld out of feelings of mutual affection between classes, as can be observed, observed in other parts of the world where feudalism exists, such as Japan. In general, this occurs in all the social institutions where a hierarchy exists that ceases to be spontaneous in virtue of being exclusively or mainly imposed by force only when it is about to disappear and give at birth to another. I said mainly because the mere tool of force is never lacking. And um, one of the things that I think is just absurd about the modern view of history is this idea that for thousands of years, people were just living in abject misery, being oppressed, basically. This is what we're meant to believe about the past, you know? Um, you know, like literally from Plato's time to, I don't know, 1776, every peasant was just kind of miserable and being oppressed by a lord somewhere, uh, you know? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure it was a, I'm sure it was a life that had its share of hardships, but, you know, modern life does too. You know, there's pros and cons to any of it. But you're right. I mean, the modern scholars will just say, oh, it was so horrible and miserable. and we, Because it's their linear view of progress, right? And mm -hmm. th this, this unquestioned assumption that we're always marching towards something better and it's, it's all progressive and we're constantly evolving. And it's never questioned that maybe we're devolving, maybe we're regressing. Things aren't mm -hmm. getting better, they're getting worse. And they never want to talk about uh, they never want to talk about that assumption or what the actual end goal is. So, so that'll bring me to my second question, which we've already kind of touched on. Why should people read Evola today? Well, because the modern world is lost and we can't fix it. Um, but I think if you want to chart a path out of the modern world, back to tradition, um, to keep a torch lit for the next generation so that there is some hope that humanity may one day find its way out of this mess, then I think Evola is quite valuable to read. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe you only chart that path out of the modern world just for yourself, not for all of humanity, but, you know, you can be one of those men among the ruins. And I think if you make a deep study of Evola rather than just casually rushing through the book so that you can say you've read it, you'll find there, there are many answers that fill in some of the blanks for you about, about God and how we got into the situation we're in today and about why we have a lot, a lot of the tendencies that we have. You know, for example, humans have a tendency to want a strong government, but why? We have a tendency to want a strong leader and look for a messiah, but why? And these are the kind of questions Evola tries to answer. But I would say it's also valuable to read it because it's inspirational and it gives you a vision of what the world could and should be and contrasts that uh, very starkly with what the world is today and all of its degeneracy. Mm -hmm. And how could you read that in this world? How could you read that and not want what he's describing? You know, a big part of the problem people have with pushing back against modernity is that people don't have a clear vision of what the alternative is. They think that the solution to say uh, communism is democracy, and they're not understanding that these are two sides of the same modern coin. You know, you cannot fight modernity with more modernity, but every alternative to modernity that is presented to us is just another version of modernity. Uh, mm -hmm. And Evola gives us something outside of that modern paradigm. He's offering us in very clear terms a way to trace the steps back to these ideal forms of our civilization out, away from the modern world. And then that gives us the possibility of one day rebuilding it. And the more people that understand that, of course, the greater chance of being able to rebuild it. Yeah, and I, I think one thing is uh, worth stressing for people who are fairly uh, new to Evola is that when, when he's talking about uh, capital T tradition, he, he doesn't have any particular time or place in mind. He's not saying, oh, we need to go back to 1422, or we need to try to, like, I don't know, if you're French, like, restore the French aristocracy or get back to some, like, particular thing. When he's talking about tradition, he's always talking about 
an ideal. Uh, yes, you know, it's outside uh, of time. It, mm -hmm. He's and he's really clear about that in the in the opening chapters of, of Revolt, where he's you know talking about the limitations of, of time and space on this world. You know, he's talking about something that's outside of time and space. You know, these platonic forms, these these metaphysical mm -hmm. truths that aren't bound by our material laws of physics. Um, but of yeah. you know, of course, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, when I first started reading uh, Evola, that was one of the real stumbling blocks that I couldn't get past was, um, you know, he says at one point, to me, myth is truer than history, right? That, like, what actually happened is actually not important. What's what the, 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 you know, the absolute is captured in the myths and the legends. So, like, to him, Arthurian legend is, like, truer to, I don't know, the spirit of England or something than um than like you know the actual kings who lived um right. which uh which is a very different like when we're talking about a mindset that you've never come across before you know if you've been through formal education you know uh in this country or in america uh with a you know armed with the tools of rationalism and empiricism a mindset that says actually fuck all that the, the myth is truer it is almost like kind of I think Bowden says at one point, it's almost like madness uh, to the kind of scientific mind to think in that way. But it makes sense if you, you know, if you think about it in this kind of neoplatonic sense where, you know, the myths actually represent the world of forms or something like this. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, in some ways, that kind of objective, empirical, scientific mindset is a little bit subversive in that it purports to be... Um, not just the best source of truth, but the only source of truth. And it's not that I don't like science, you know, I actually was really interested in it for a while, but um, it has its place and it can't answer all questions. The only questions it can tell us are about things that can be weighed and measured and quantified. And there are things outside of that, you know, it can't tell us about the metaphysical universe and that's where myth comes in and that's where legends come in uh that's where archetypes come in yeah i mean i think we've i mean without getting into any specifics you know what i'm talking about we've seen in very recent times uh just mm -hmm. so easily science can be abused as well that it's not it's no real arbiter of truth no um, it's not because it cannot posit an absolute truth and therefore it's subject to be abused by power as we've seen well science itself at least i mean not the actual scientific method but science itself is very democratic you know truth is determined by consensus of the scientific community and the, the you know the un, unnamed experts uh that we can't mm -hmm. question um so it has inherent in it all the same problems that a system like democracy does <laughs> yeah I, I can't remember where it where, where it was we did um Earlier on, we did uh, um, we looked at ten quotations uh, from Evola, and uh, I, in fact, I don't think we talked about it on the on the stream. But uh, let me let me just pull that up now. I actually was struck by the fact that Evola picked up on this uh, potential for what he calls. I mean, he's always railing against America and Americanism as the kind of as the no, as the node of subversion, if you want, um, yeah. <laughs> he's on he's onto that idea that the Bolsheviks and the and the Soviet Russia were almost like the false opposition, and that the true the true enemy was always America. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to let me just see if I can find that uh, quotation because oh yeah, that, that's what he says. He says, in the face of our radicalism, in particular, the antithesis between Red East and the Democratic West appears irrelevant. The forms of standardization, conformism, democratic leveling, frantic overproduction, the more or less arrogant and explicit cult of the expert or the brain trust and the petty materialism of America can only clear the road for the final phase. So it, it, it's interesting that he that he zooms in on the cult of the expert or the, or the brain trust because um, it's pretty clear at this point that we're run by a kind of a coalition of um, merchant and this kind of fake scientist priest class you know like fauci is a is a is a, is a priest leader yes. if that makes any sense yeah 
Yeah. Um, it's a perfect anyway. quotation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Let, what do you consider his essential works and why? Well, obviously, I'm going to say revolt against the modern world. Um, but there's a reason that, that was a really clear choice for my video series. And it's because it's the best synthesis of his thought and the vision that he's trying to present. Uh, every idea that he presents in Revolt, he explores more in depth in his other books and essays. You know, for example, you can read more about the dynamics between man and woman in Eros and to some extent the yoga of power and mystery of the grail goes very deeply into the idea of the sacred king. And, you know, all these books of his kind of overlap with each other. But with Revolt, you're getting this organized buffet of all of his thoughts without going so deeply into any single theme that it becomes overwhelming. And he he lays it out all very intelligently so that each chapter builds on the ideas of the previous ones. And uh, of course, there are deeper themes that run through the book and you do get that picture. So it wouldn't be fair to depict it as being a shallow discussion of his ideas because it's certainly not. But his entire worldview is touched on in this book. And if you were to just start with one of his other books, you're going to be missing a huge part of his worldview and you won't be reading it in the proper context. So you could miss something um, or misinterpret something. And so while there's a number of, of books we could include on the list of his essential works, I think Revolt is the one to start with, clearly. Um, maybe some people have seen that graphic with the flow chart um, that has the order in which to read Evola's books in it. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just don't agree with it at all. Um, I kind of suspect it's the order that the maker of the graphic might have read the books. Well, he, starts the of... Grail. he starts with the Holy Grail, which I, I don't understand at all, personally. But... No, because actually that was written, I believe, as an appendix to Revolt. And that's mm -hmm. actually a good one um, to read right after Revolt or in conjunction with it. But um, I don't think that that flowchart actually makes the most sense for a new student of Evola who wants to read the books in an orderly fashion in which the ideas logically build on each other. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you as I said, there, there are some you can read in conjunction with Revolt or just kind of side by side as you go through it uh, or read it after. But um, the others I would say are essential. You know, I would say I would say Eros is very important for understanding the dynamics of men and women. And you would probably want to read that and have a good grasp on that before attempting uh, Yoga of Power, which is quite a difficult book, for example. And I know everyone says, oh, Ride the Tiger, Man Among the Ruins. But I think that's a little bit more dependent on your personal interests. You know, um, do your interests lie more in the political realm or the spiritual realm? If it's more political, then definitely go read those books. But after you've read Revolt, because you need to understand his his Weltanschauung to put those political ideas in their proper context, because mm -hmm. his political ideas are not separate from his spiritual ideas. And even if spirituality doesn't interest you that much, it did interest him. And you do need to understand how he came to these political ideas and that those political ideas are subservient to his spiritual ideas. And I think people who tend to only read the political works um, sometimes misinterpret him because they're not understanding that spiritual context. Now, for people whose interest is more spiritual, then I would say Doctrine of Awakening is essential. It's one of his hardest books. Not that that would put off a sincere spiritual seeker, I'm sure. But, you know, go for that one. Go for the Hermetic tradition. Go for Yoga of Power if you're really keen to develop a spiritual practice and undertake the kind of self-initiation that Evola talks about, then I would say all three volumes of Introduction to Magic should be on your Amazon wish list. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I actually I actually provided my own guide earlier on, and you'll be interested to know that um, I, I actually put off, I don't say read Revolt first. Um, and that is because in my experience, people just can't like... They hit it and they're like that it just they can't it's impenetrable to them they can't get into it so 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 i suggest um trying to read like some of his more his kind of shorter essays where he's where he's kind of uh just commenting on a like, contemporary italian life as a kind of way in because um i think it's easy to forget how what kind of alien worldview this is coming from people who you know may have an interest in politics or something um you know, I just think it's easy, it's easy to forget how difficult it is to get yourself into the mindset of someone like Evola if you're used to reading, like, I don't know, Murray Rothbard or something like that. 
<laughs> yeah, he's he's definitely challenging, not just to read, but he's challenging a lot of your basic assumptions about the world too. Um, what was the first book of his that you read, if you, uh, if you want to say? Um, uh, well, I, I read Revolt first, um, but I find it difficult. Um, and in fact, I, I find it more rewarding reading it this time, again, in preparation for this. Um, I I always recommend Orientations as the first. I think we did a whole stream on Orientations, didn't we? That that kind of we short did a, like a four hour long stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I think that's a good I think that's a good like one shot intro. Uh, and I there's a there's a collection called Bow in the Club that Ar Arctos published uh, a couple of years back, which um, you know it's just like when he's talking about like punks and hippies and so on. It's just a world that modern people are used to dealing with. So you can kind of like, I don't know, get acclimatized to his way of thinking. It's definitely more accessible, yes. Some of those kind essay of, collections yeah. are a little easier to, to get into. But just I, I just feel like it's, in, yeah. I, it, you could use it for that, yeah. I do feel, though, that you're, you're missing a lot of the context and you're reading these essays and is kind of because they're easier to read too you're not really getting um what i, I mean what this is my personal opinion every you guys mm -hmm. disagree but um what are his most important and interesting ideas don't always come across in some of those shorter essays that said i mean i have read some of those and i've, I've enjoyed them um, and part of my enjoyment for them was that i didn't have to engage my brain quite so much to read them and i could just read mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will. I will say, um, I I know Hermetic tradition is very highly thought of. I was trying to read it again earlier in preparation for this interview, and I was just, I can't get my head around the esoteric, like the magic and the esoteric, um, like I yoga of power and doctrine of awakening. I can get my head around because he's talking about specific techniques, and you know I understand the you know the left path and the right path. But what, but when he's talking about the alchemical symbols and so on, um, I find that very hard to, even now. Like, I mean, how, do you have any yeah, advice for getting into? Look, that he's he in Hermetic <laughs> tradition. He's assuming the reader has um, a background knowledge. He's not writing this for the absolute beginner, and so he's just referring to all of these alchemical things, and he's not really explaining them because he assumes that if you're reading this book, you should already know those things. So mm -hmm. if if you're finding hermetic tradition a little bit too hard, you might want to just kind of set it aside for a bit and just go do some study on the things that he's talking about. Learn learn about some of the alchemical terminology and symbols at the very least, um, because otherwise it's almost like reading a foreign language and you're just like, well, what is he talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the moon. So you got to, yeah, you know, you, you got to learn the language that he's speaking first, in particular for that book. Um, there's a reason it's highly thought of, but it's not his most accessible book by any stretch. Yeah, um, just a, just out of interest, um, the um, the magic books are the one. I mean, I've pretty much got all of Evelyn's books, but I do not have the magic ones. Um, I have got electronic copies of them that I flick through, but I can't. Like, I still struggle to connect that book he did with the was it the UR group. Mm -hmm. with his with his later work do you have any insights on how that collection relates to something like revolts or, or or anything else that you did well keep in mind that evola had his his view was that there really are no modern religions that offer a path to transcendence like they're all corrupt right so yeah. whereas many of the other traditionalists chose a religion to practice, Evola never did. And, you know, some traditionalists kind of criticize him for that. But his view was that the only way is to self initiate. And in some ways, this is what Doctrine of Awakening is about. He's, he's talking about this path that, you know, if you follow these steps, you can achieve liberation. Um, and this is, you know, the Theravedic Buddhist way of doing things. Um, so with Introduction to Magic, he's kind of uh, laying out a roadmap for self-initiation. You've got, uh, because he holds initiation in very high regard. You know, he's saying you, you, can't, you basically can't um, make the Olympian leap into the heavens and join the gods when you die if you're not initiated. You need to produce that ontological change within yourself first. 
Um, it's not enough just to read his books. You've actually got to do this stuff is what mm -hmm. he's saying. And so Introduction to Magic, it, it, it's um, three volumes. The third volume just published uh, recently by Inner Traditions. Um, I believe a hardcover set is coming out in the near future for those who want to hold off for a nicer set. Um, but it lays out different um, practices that you can follow in an attempt to self-initiate. And in and they do include, you know, warnings that, uh, you know, don't go down this path if you're not prepared to finish it because it will be very dangerous to you. You mm -hmm. have to be committed to finishing it. Um, so those are not books that I typically recommend to the casual reader. I would say if you're just a casual reader, you should probably just stay away from those. Um, but that's why I said if you're a sincere spiritual seeker and you um, you would like to attempt that self-initiation that he talks about, you could look at those books. Yeah, that, uh, my, my understanding is that um, Gwynon, who in, who in some ways was like closest thing I ever had to like a master or a mentor or something, at least as I understand their relationship, because he was a bit older and Evola always looked up to him and so on. But Gwynon seemed to believe that you need for initiation, you need um, you need a guru or a mentor to kind of bring you in. Whereas <laughs> Evola believe you can kind of you could do it alone, even though it's hard. You could you could uh, you don't well. Need a mentor. It's not that Evola thought you didn't need one. It's that he didn't think there are any to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that there are no more legitimate spiritual paths that have not been. Um, corrupted beyond recognition. So sure, you could choose a spiritual path um, within some kind of religious institution and seek initiation within that tradition, which is what Gwinnon did. He became a Sufi in the, the esoteric Islamic tradition, um, as did a number of others. Um, you know, I think Gwinnon's view was that something like Hinduism was too uh, inaccessible to a Westerner. But, you know, Evola sampled a lot of religions. He studied a lot of religious texts and mm -hmm. he never came across one that he thought was suitable for what he wanted to do for this path to liberation. And um, with the other fellows in his group that contributed essays to Intro to Magic, they're, you know, they're trying to kind of chart this path to self-initiation based on what they've all studied in these various esoteric traditions. You know, how could one self-initiate? Because here we are here in the Kali Yuga, and it's it's hard to even, like, even if you wanted to find a, tra a religious tradition to join, it's very hard to find one that you're going to find suitable. Mm -hmm. Maybe you say to yourself, oh, I'd love to become um, Orthodox. Well, where I live, there's no Orthodox churches here. That wouldn't mm -hmm. be possible for me if that's what I decided to do. Oh, well, um, maybe I'd like to, um, you know, learn, learn more about Hinduism uh, of some variety or another. Well, you're going to go to India and find a guru to initiate you because you're probably not going to find a legitimate one in the West. Yeah. You know, that's, and I mean, we yeah. can debate the merits of the Catholic Church all day long. Um, mm -hmm. So what yeah, are your the, options, really? It, the, the other thing I've come to understand is that there was actually some, another kind of quite core disagreement between Evra and Gwynon, which is that, um, and I only, I, I've actually only truly understood this in the past few days, which is that um, Gwynon believed that the, the, that the priest class, like the Brahmin uh, caste, if you want to put it that way, uh, should, should, like, could rule and be on top in the kind of in you know in the golden age where whereas in my understanding evola always has in mind a much more kind of solar uh almost like a divine oh. king who yes he has a celestial body but he also wields a sword and that um for him the priest class alone has a what, what does he call it a lunar amazonian feminine energy which leads mm -hmm. to kind of silk you know it degrades degrades it to the silver age um i hadn't quite appreciated that difference between the two of them but uh, i believe Evola saw the west as superior to the east because the east had this kind of passive priestly way of doing things whereas, whereas Gwynon almost saw things the other way around is that right 
Um, yes, it was a major disagreement between them. It's a big topic to get into. It's actually going to be the subject of the next revolt episode. And um, I was actually considering including in that episode, because otherwise it'll be quite short, um, including in that episode, some of the debate between Gwynon and Evola and explaining, you know, why they differ the way they do. But um, all my notes for that are downstairs. So um <laughs> <laughs> I should probably just leave it for the episode anyway, so that I can put it all together in like a uh, an organized mm -hmm. thingy thing. No, my words. <laughs> so, so uh, I'll ask you my next question then, which is: Do you have sure. a favorite work of his, and why? It is really hard for me to choose a favorite because there isn't one that clearly jumps out as being like this this clear front runner. Um, I mean, I could repeat myself here and just be like, oh, revolt, because it's a good summing up. But, you know, a lot of my enjoyment of Evola has come from reading his other books, which have helped me gain a deeper understanding of what he's saying in revolt. But so, you know, I could, I could say I enjoyed these other books more because they're richer and deeper discussions of these topics. They're all equally good books in their own subject areas. Um, and of course, you know, some books I still haven't read. I would say that Doctrine of Awakening holds a special place in my heart, though, because that was actually the first of Evola's books that I read. And uh, it was perhaps a bit I was perhaps a bit silly to start with one of his hardest books. Um, but, you know, it, it just it was what I needed at that time in my life and it helped me a lot. But I would like to now go back and reread it again. Now that I have a deeper understanding of Evola and I, I've read many of his other books, I think I would probably get a lot more out of it now. Um, it, so it, I, I have a uh, question, if you don't mind uh, me asking. I I read the Yoga of Power recently, and um, I was struck. Uh, you know, that's all about like different breathing techniques and things. And at one point, he even says, "Listen, if you don't know what you're doing, you could kill yourself here." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, and then he gets to the end of this whole like ritual, and he says something like, um, "Of course, if you're not up for it, it's all for naught." <laughs> So oh, yeah, right, we go. <laughs> but then, but then, of course, like reading it is nothing. Like you know, unless mm. you do it, you know, yeah. intellectually understanding it means nothing. But it, my understanding is that there's a difference between a left a left path and a and a, and a right hand path, or the the wet path and the dry path, the path of action, path of contemplation. Do you have um? Do you have a kind of preference yourself for, you know, do you do you go for the the left hand or the right hand and, and if so why or is that too personal a question <laughs> um i actually haven't made a decision on that for my own life yet um i feel like that is a decision that probably requires a little bit more um contemplation on my part um because i think we all have in us this tendency to think that we could take that left hand path, we could master ourselves enough to harness those energies and use them as an impetus towards transcendence. Mm -hmm. um, but people think that because they don't know themselves and they're blind to their own weaknesses um, mm -hmm. to, to, and you're just walking a razor's edge with that path. And if you stumble, you're going to fatally cut yourself. Um, this is why, you know, most people are probably best to stay with that path of contemplation, that uh, the right hand path, because it's safer. Um, you will get something out of it. it. Many times those are, you know, their devotional paths. I understand why Evola preferred a left hand path approach. But, um, you know, for myself, I, I can see the value in in the right hand path mm -hmm. and i just don't know if i have the right nature for it to really commit to it for a lifetime um that said i'm you know i because i mean i'm not super young but i'm not old yet either you know and mm -hmm. i'm uh there's maybe still a lot i need to learn about myself before i can truly choose a path and know that it will be the right one because I don't want to choose the wrong one. Obviously that would have disastrous consequences for my soul. No, no, I mean, just, um, you mentioned Eros earlier on. Uh, I got into this. I don't know. You probably missed it, but I, I recently got into a whole, I wouldn't call it a drama, but it was a, it was a pretty high profile debate on where I, ins I used Evola 
in my video and I insisted on traditional gender roles. This was the whole thing where uh, there were these memes basically of um, young men kind of acting like women, licking the abs of a of a woman who's kind of muscly and built up, right? I don't know if you've seen these. No. I don't know if you've seen these images, but I mean, I was just like, I don't know, I put out this video called Zoomers are Coomers where I, I kind of got a bit angry and said, <laughs> why are so many young men behaving like teenage schoolgirls, you know? Um, hmm. And this was the this was the problem, but it's led to I don't know it's had a pretty big afterlife uh, by YouTube standards, and it's still there was there was even a video by by Vouch yesterday, kind of talking about it. Um, but um, the um, when I was doing the when I was kind of uh, doing some of my response videos as part of that, I went uh, I went to Eros and the Mysteries of Love and. Um, my understanding is that, in his view, women only have like women also have the the action and the contemplation paths available, but they can only achieve it as lover or mother. Is that something that you've uh, kind of thought about, or are you gonna like, or are you I've gonna try to do it as a, a as, as a kind of man? <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, this is something I've thought about a lot, and um, you know, one of my dearest girlfriends um, is you know, probably more of a student of Evola than I am. Um, she could probably give you way more intelligent answers. But this is something she and I have discussed um, actually quite recently. And it's, you know, our feeling is that this is a big problem um, for women because we can't achieve spiritual liberation without a man. A man, like we experience God through a man in some fashion or other. It doesn't matter which way we do it, but we need that man as an intermediary, just the way the plebs need the sacred king as an intermediary. We need a spiritual access for ourselves. Um, and we find that in a man. Now, there are almost no men in the world today who are capable of that. Um, there are men who probably could provide something to a degree of that for their wives if their wives weren't too spiritually ambitious. But, um, you know, for a woman like me and for my friend, you know, women who seriously study Avila were definitely in the minority. And, you know, I, I read this stuff and I'm just like, I almost wish I was a man so that I actually could have an opportunity to do this because you know, as a woman, I, I feel like my options are so limited um, and I maybe just have to hope to be to get a better reincarnation in my next life. Um, because trying to do it as a woman there, we don't. Um, and I say this as a woman who I've got a fairly well developed masculine side. I'm not saying that I am masculine, but um, I have really developed like kind of my 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 animus, my my inner man. And I still struggle with providing myself that that access within. Um, I really rely on a man to provide that for me. And mm -hmm. that man, essentially, you know, he he needs to be more spiritually advanced than I am so that he can kind of be that guidepost on my spiritual journey. And, um, you know, for for the other women I've spoken to, they all feel much the same. So. I, I do agree with what Evola says in Eros about men and women and, and also about women's ability to seek transcendence. And this is also why I don't feel in any rush to choose the right or the left-hand path because part of me is kind of like, well, what does it matter? I'm just a woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask you the next question. Then, that, uh, you're, you're known for... Uh, you're basically known on YouTube for popularizing um, revolt against the modern world. Some very high production values on those videos. Uh, what has been the most rewarding aspect of making this series for you personally? I, I wish I was known on YouTube for that, but unfortunately, I, if you if you search up Julius Evola on YouTube, it won't bring up my videos. I've noticed, um, and a number of other people have told me this. So. I don't know, maybe someday it'll be known. Do you put it in the tag? 
Yeah, but it's in the description. In some cases, it's in the title. It just like it won't show up until like the second or third page of results. So yeah, it's so very evil, bizarre. Evil Susan, evil Susan doing that, but yeah. It, so the uh, aristocrats <laughs> of the soul know know you for know you for it. <laughs> so if you guys like my series, please do me a favor and share it with other people because I think it's the only way anyone ever sees it is if they if it's been shared somewhere. Um, but yeah, in terms of the most rewarding aspects for me personally. Um, it's really given me an opportunity to go more in depth of studying these ideas that I probably, well, certainly would not have done otherwise. And it's been hugely rewarding and beneficial for me. But um, I'm always, con I'm always really concerned that I'm going to say something incorrect. So I read a lot of extra books and I consult with people who know more about it than I do because I want to really minimize that risk of making this inaccurate interpretation because the worst thing for me would be as if like some great scholar of Evola came along in my comment section and told me I got something completely wrong. I'd made this huge mistake and I'd just be like, oh my God. <laughs> um, so, so I kind of have this aversion to being a dilettante and it's, it has driven me to this higher level of knowledge and, and study of Evola, which, you know, it's made me a vastly more educated person as a result. Um, I, I approached Doctrine of Awakening actually in a similar way when I read that. I just didn't make any videos about it and never wrote out my notes uh, the way that I did with Revolt, which in hindsight, I, I should have probably done that. But I, I also appreciate being able to offer um, some help to others who were much like myself in that um, maybe they were mired in an, this nihilistic, scientific, atheistic worldview that's too heavily focused on biology or other aspects of physical reality and, and give them some footing to start a spiritual quest. And I have heard from heaps of people who have experienced that. And um, I'm always so happy to hear that from people. Um, and if any of you have ever sent me a message like that and I didn't respond, I'm very sorry. I'm terrible with correspondence. Um, but you know, that benefits me personally because I, I would obviously like more, <laughs> I'd like there to be more like-minded people in the world, obviously. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I noticed looking back through, uh, revolt is actually how short all the chapters are, but your mm -hmm. videos are like half an hour, an hour long for each of those, you know, the, the actual chapter is only a couple of pages really, but you, yeah. you spend like a whole hour. Unpacking yeah, the... because I'm incorporating a lot of this side research from other books and stuff into it to try to, uh, I want to give like a context to what people have read in, in, in the book, because, you know, maybe he just mentions something in passing, but doesn't explain it. But it's actually like, if you went and learned a little more about it, you'd be like, oh, all the pieces that he's referring to now, they just suddenly fall into place. You know, you never know what piece of additional information is just going to make everything click in someone's brain. So I try to be really thorough with that. I like to give um, examples where I can. Um, I think the longest episode was uh, number 10, Life and Death of Civilizations. And I actually incorporated um, a lot from Synthesis of the Doctrine of Race in that because it's this question on which Evola is frequently attacked. And no, it had just literally been published like a month before I started writing the script. So it was actually really great timing. And so nobody had really read it yet. I don't know. Maybe I was the first person to read it. Um, but by incorporating all that, now anyone who reads the chapter has this framework for understanding what he's referring to when he talks about race of the spirit versus race of the blood. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if they ever find themselves now in a debate with somebody who's criticizing Evola as a racist, you know, hopefully they've got some basis from which to understand his position and defend it. Um, yeah, so I, that's what I, I try to do. I, I have that book uh, as well as the the one Myth of the Blood. Um, one of the things I um, it's kind of difficult to get your head around, but in his conception, it seems like you can kind of spiritually become a member of another race. Um, so I don't know, you could be, a, you could be a Nord Nordic, but be spiritually Jewish, for example. Um, how does that, how does that work? <laughs> um, it's largely just due to intermixing of people's, um, you know, you could kind of just think of it as like a natural entropy of humanity because there's always going to be interbreeding across mm -hmm. tribal lines, you know, 
you might have kind of like the core of your society is still all very pure, but the people on the outskirts who live near other tribes, well, they're going to kind of mix a little bit. So um, it's, I think it's just something that happens as, as time progresses on and is probably unavoidable. Um, but because that's a question that bothers a lot of people in right-wing spheres, I wanted to address it in that episode as well as I could. And then immediately after having released that episode, I did um, a live stream specifically just talking about synthesis of the doctrine of race because people had so many questions about it. So um, I could have probably made that episode twice as long. <laughs> for, for, for me, almost the easiest the easiest way, I I mean, this is when I'm reading stuff, I always try to translate it so that my own kind of lay mind can understand things, you know. But um, mm. I think of like white women twerking, right? <laughs> uh, okay. As a, as a kind of, as a, no, no I, don't, I don't mean I just think of that. I think of that as an embodiment of um, how, okay, you could be of one race, but you're spiritually embodying a different, a different race. That's obviously a style and a rhythm and a and a behavior that comes from a different people. Um, yeah. And in fact, he talks about this a lot. He says um, he has an essay somewhere called uh, I don't know if I can kind of name the title on YouTube, but 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 essentially, he's saying that he thinks America. Um, America is kind of like spiritually black in a way, and that um, as that has gone on over time, it, uh, America had started to export that back to back to ancient Europe. So that so that now um, you you know now even in Europe you see white people picking up like black ways of being in any sense. Um, yeah. So and and I, and I and I just think that. You know, that footage that someone like PJW will share of, you know, you can see like 50 women in a gym all twerking together, you know, um, kind of kind of sums it up to me uh, as to how this might happen. Um, yes. and, and I believe it, his point, though, is to say, well, the blood is not enough. Like, exactly. So what if all those it's people, not like, they're, they're not they're not upholding the spirit of what it means to, you know, be part of this particular race? Exactly. Which is why, you know, you could theoretically find um, an African with an Aryan soul. You know, it would be unlikely. But there probably are a few out there. Yeah. You know? Um, so his position is that, yeah, I mean, there's just been this uh, mixing that has resulted in the race of the spirit no longer matching the race of the body. You know, you know how everybody, like all the whole like physiognomy is real thing yeah. right mm -hmm. like that it, it is it used to be more true than it is today you used to be able to look at somebody and know that their inner character matched their physical appearance and you know at one point that was probably tied to a person's race or caste um mm -hmm. of course that's no longer the case you could see a very beautiful person and they've got just like the ugliest soul you know yeah. Who cares if they're um, they're like some hyperborean ubermensch from Sweden, if they're you know a feminist, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, <laughs> and and they, and they work for a bank. <laughs> I mean, the, the other thing, uh, I mean, as someone who's half uh, Iranian or Persian, uh, obviously this this um, this part of it kind of raised an eyebrow of mine, um, you know. <laughs> I'm always told, you know, Iran means land of the Aryans and so on. But his conception of Aryan is, um, he doesn't just, I mean, everybody will think, oh, well, that means the blonde haired, blue eyed guy from from Germany. But it, it appears that in his conception, he includes many kind of ancient civilizations in that as a kind of animating spirit where you have a kind of Persian branch of it and even an Indo- even an Indian branch of it, like the original Brahmins, are meant to be of a like a different race. Um, this uh, this is obviously difficult uh, if you're used to biological arguments, right? Uh, exactly. Um, like he's thinking of the, the Aryans almost as more like descendants of the Hyperboreans. Yeah. And he speaks in in synthesis. He speaks of the Hyperborean migrations, the three waves of migrations, and he speaks of this kind of. Um, 
how those who came last, you know, who now would be, uh, you know, the, the Nordic types, the blonde, blue eyed Scandinavians and Germans and such, you know, they're the most recent descendants from that. But because they stayed too long in the winter, they lost their spiritual chrism. And so we could speak of this eternal winter of the white man's soul. This is mm -hmm. why um, European folkish spirituality is kind of dead. Um, and I don't mean to offend anybody in your audience who practices that, but there's no denying that um, the metaphysics of European folkish spirituality um, have largely been lost. And what we have of it's very degraded or corrupted, uh, maybe recorded by Christians who are very hostile to it, for example. Um, so, mm -hmm. like, we have to ask ourselves, well, how did that happen? How did our how did we lose our spiritual chrism? And yet it's so vibrant in India. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. These mm -hmm. these dark these dark Indians who call themselves Aryans practicing this really vibrant, rich spirituality um, with all these uh, religious scriptures to rely on. And Evola's answer is, well, they're the descendants of the people who left Hyperborea first and they maintained mm -hmm. their spiritual chrism because they didn't suffer through that that winter and the changing of the climate. Yeah, there is. I seem to remember there's also this second group who get like lost under the sea or something. Is that right? Have I got that right? They um, no, like... he's um, in that one that would be so he says there's um, there's kind of um, this transversal migration down into the Indian subcontinent. That was the first one. The second one was east west um, mm -hmm. and involves the Mediterranean and Atlantis. And then the third was the, the ones that settled into northern Europe. And so I think you're referring to that east-west one. Um, yeah, the I Atlantis don't... one. Yeah, but yeah, I thought, like did, they, didn't... they get lost in the lost city of Atlantis, or something. Um, well, I mean, you could. There, there are arguments that those people, like the survivors, dispersed into mm -hmm. the Americas and parts of Africa and the Mediterranean basin. Mm -hmm. um, and his his view is that Atlantis was um, kind of a it was like originally a colony of Hyperborea and it was set up to mirror that um, as, mm -hmm. uh, as another spiritual center. But um, there are a lot of theories about what happened to Atlantis. And if I start talking about it, people are just going to think I'm like crazy if they don't already. <laughs> so I probably should just keep those uh, ideas to myself. Uh, all right. So I'll, I'll ask my next question to get us off this. Um, could you, could Save you me. <laughs> Could you uh, recommend any hidden gems or off the beaten path, Evola? Um, well, um, the one that did immediately come to mind when you sent me that list was uh, Synthesis of the Doctrine of Race. And part of that's because, you know, it's only recently been published. It's a bit hard to find. I think it's only available as a PDF on Lulu, or at least it was when I got it. And I, I it... bought it from Lulu. I got a, high, I got a uh, paperback version, but... It's not on Amazon. You have to go on kind of weird websites to get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a legit website. It's self publishing, but it's, yeah, it's not easy to find. And um, it's a book that addresses a lot of the questions people have about his racial philosophy and how it ties into his spiritual philosophy. So, you know, for people who are concerned about that topic, I think that would be a really good one. And it's kind of meant to be a sequel to Myth of the Blood. But I have to say, I personally found that one really boring, and I don't think I've ever recommended it to anybody. Yeah, myth, of, um, myth of blood is, is boring it's, it's like it's easy. it's like a literature review of early 20th century racist thought and it's just like yeah, he, he's critiquing uh it's chamberlain you know the mid-century germans etc cetera, etc cetera, yeah for for most people in our milieu i don't think they need that overview um it's it's probably one that can be skipped. I'm glad Arctos has published it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm glad it's out there. I just personally don't have any interest in reading it. And I don't think any, you know, I don't know anyone who has really enjoyed it. I, I do um, think, I, I do think though, that, that there are quite a lot of, um, I mean, let's face it, there are lots of uh, biological racists around. So maybe, there are. maybe that view critiqued from his kind of unique perspective. 
you know, yeah, well, that's what he's doing in synthesis is that first he's laying out in Myth of the Blood, he's laying out what all of the, these arguments are of the day for biological racism, which was just a, a like it was just another school of philosophy almost at that time. This kind of anth anthropology that was becoming um, very widespread in that day. But then he goes on to synthesis and he's like, right, but biological race isn't actually enough and it's actually the least important. And here's why. So if you don't already understand all the arguments of biological race, then maybe you'd want to read Myth of the Blood first. Like if you're just a normie coming into Evola, which it seems unlikely to me, but it could happen. Um, you know, if they're not familiar with those arguments, then they, I would tell them to read Myth of the Blood first. But I've never yet had that opportunity. I, I, will, I will confess, Cat, uh, that in my um, in my guide that uh, came out earlier today, when people are going to be watching this, um, I did recommend they leave those two books as the absolute last, Myth of the Blood and, Synth and Synthesis of the Doctrine, um, on the basis that I feel like there are elements of that, though, even though even though it's an interesting aspect of his thought, I feel like there are elements of it that are not fully fleshed out or not fully thought through because he he always talks about the primacy of the spirit over the blood. But in other okay, times, well, in other times he, seems to appeal to the, he seems to appeal to the blood at other times, you know. He footnote in his footnotes in Revolt, he references that book fairly often, which is why mm -hmm. I was glad to get a copy. Um for that reason, I recommend it alone. Um, however, I understand why you feel like it's maybe not fleshed out. And I have to say um, that after I got a copy of um, J.J. Backhoffen's Das Mutterrecht, mm -hmm. it made a lot more sense to me where Evola was coming from because that book was very influential on Evola's thinking in regards to the different races of the spirit and also in regards to his views on men and women. Um, mm, yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, this book is, I, I actually really loved it. I highly recommend it. It's a little bit hard to um, get a copy in English translation, but they are out there. They're a little bit spendy, but um, it was well worth the read for sure. And it made so much more of Evola's thought make sense. And in particular, um, where he was coming from in regards of like these different races of spirit. Well, I'm glad you mentioned him because I earlier on, on Evola Day, I also did a, a video on the top 10 influences on Evola's thought. And obviously, number one was uh, Gwenom. Uh, I put as number two this figure here, JJ. How do you say it? Ba Backofen. Back Backofen. Yeah, he's like a Swiss anthropologist, kind of mythologist, I guess, of the of the 19th century. But um, when I was doing uh, research, he kept on coming up again and again as somebody who... Um, is really foundational to Evola's view of the of the different uh, of the different ages and um, yeah. you know of uh, pa matriarchal societies and patriarchal societies and so on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think there are areas in in which Evola would disagree with him, um, but it's a really intelligently written book. Um, I it, I enjoyed it so much, and I'm absolutely shattered that it's in a shipping container and I won't have access to it for months now because, <laughs> like. Probably like a, even just in this last month, I've wanted it like three or four times already. And I was just, oh, I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the interest of time, I will ask you uh, my penultimate question here, which is Evla draws from different traditions like yoga, Buddhism, Zen, and so on. But if you, um, he's got a book called The Met, the, the, what is it, The Mask and the Face of Contemporary Spirituality. Or spiritualism, I the version I've got actually came out like about a month ago. It's called the Fall of Spirituality. Um, yeah. I don't. I think there was some dispute between the publishers, but Inner yeah. Traditions have brought out a copy, uh, the old copies from Arkdos, but you can't find that anymore. Um, but if you if you look at that, he basically criticizes like all of the branches of like New Age theosophy, you know, various different strands of occultism and so on. And he basically says, like, none of these, are, none of these are real. These are all like fake, fake or modern bastardizations of what spirituality is about. And he and they attack them for um, what is called picking a mix, 
picking and mixing, you know. Um, but how, like, to an outsider, it looks like this is what Evola and Gwanan and the other traditionists are doing. How can this be reconciled? You know, when Evola is drawing on, say, Tantra, what's he doing if not picking and mixing? So that's my question. Um, that is a really great question. I'm actually, I'm glad you asked it because it's, uh, it's definitely something that people who don't understand Evola will try to criticize him on. Um, sometimes people try to characterize what he's doing as, as syncretism. So for those who might not be familiar with that word, it just refers to a blending of religions and beliefs, and it tries to be inclusive. And this is really what new ageism is and theosophy as well. Um, Evola goes beyond these things though. He was actually at one point interested in theosophy until he delved into it enough to realize that it is really just syncretism. And it's not that theosophy lacks any substantive value, but its error is in the attempt of trying to draw together a multitude of different religious traditions, evolutionary science, fuzzy emotions, fanciful thinking, trying to draw them all into, into some coherent form. And the conclusion ends up being something that fails to translate into a legitimate path to transcendence. Now, by contrast, Evola spent his lifetime making a really deep study of different paths, particularly their esoteric versions. And he wasn't just going to this spiritual buffet and picking and choosing the parts he liked best and then trying to tie them together into some new um, religion that just suited him. What he was doing was he was looking for the commonalities in these teachings and saying, because this theme seems to repeat across time, cultures, and distance, we can assume that this is a clue about something in the world of tradition, and it's speaking to a pure metaphysical truth. So he's looking for clues to distilled metaphysical truth, and that truth exists outside of and independent of any human religion. So this is a really important distinction to make. And when Evola draws on a particular tradition, um, well, actually, he says this um, right in the introduction to Revolt, which I wisely brought up here with me. So I might actually just quickly read this paragraph with you because I know I've got it marked in here. It's, a, it's just in the foreword where he's explaining how he's approaching um, this traditional methodology of his. He says, in the course of this book, I will refer to various Eastern and Western traditions choosing those that exemplify through a clearer and more complete expression the same spiritual principle or phenomenon. The method that I use has as little in common with the eclecticism or comparative methodology of modern scholars as the method of parallaxes, which is used to determine the exact position of a star by reference to how it appears from different places. Also, this method has as little in common with eclecticism, to borrow an image of Guénon's, as the multilingual person's choice of the language that offers the best expression to a given thought. Thus, what I call the traditional method is usually characterized by a double principle, ontologically and objectively by the principle of correspondence, which ensures an essential and functional correlation between analogous elements, presenting them as simple homologous forms of the appearance of a central and unitary meaning, and epistemologically and subjectively by the generalized use of the principle of induction, which is here understood as a discursive approximation of a spiritual intuition, in which what is realized is the integration and the unification of the diverse elements encountered in the same one meaning and the same one principle. Now that probably sounds like a bit of a word salad, right? So let's break down what he's saying here. This is one of those difficult paragraphs that requires a careful reading. But he's very clear about what he's doing here. You need to read it closely. He says he's referring to different traditions because he's trying to choose examples that best illustrate the pure metaphysical principle. And he wants to give us a clear and complete expression of it. To do that, he's going to give us examples from all over the world, East and West. Some of those examples might only grasp at just a portion of the truth. And then another example will help fill in the blanks. And so he's giving us this analogy of this method of parallaxes to determine the position of a star where you look at it from different angles. So you can think of each of these traditions that he draws from as being uh, like a mountain peak, right? So from those peaks, one could see the same star. And you can think of that star as being emblematic of a metaphysical truth in this case, but you'll see it from a different angle on each of those peaks. And he's really explicit that this isn't eclecticism. 
He says his method relies on what? The principle of correspondence. This is a hermetic principle, which is essentially to say, as above, so below. So when we see this reflection repeated in the world, we can conclude something about the thing that's reflecting it from higher above. And he's trying to show a correlation between these disparate elements and show that behind them there's a unitary meaning. And he also says that he relies on induction, which he says is like a spiritual intuition. Now, some people might say that, oh, well, his intuition is hardly an empirical science. It's not an academic approach. And of course, Evelyn re rejects that kind of object objective empiricism here because what we're talking about isn't something that can be scientifically weighed and measured. But what is intuition really? It's something that develops when you, um, when you become used to recognizing patterns with something that's really familiar to you. You know, it becomes second nature to you. You don't think about it consciously anymore because it's just become intuitive. Well, Evelis deeply studied the texts of all these traditions, and so of course he's developed an intuition, this ability to see the patterns and read between the lines. So to sum all that up into a singular point, there's a big difference between the picking and mixing, which is what the New Ageism does, and what Evola is doing, which is looking for that unitary form, that form in the platonic sense, behind all of these traditions. So rather than trying to tie together multiple religions, he's going beyond religion entirely. Does that yeah, make th sense? Yes, it did. Uh, okay. Very, uh, very, uh, very full answer. Very good. Um, yet my, you know, correct me if I'm wrong though, but my understanding is that um, both Evola and the other traditionalists as well say that once you actually settle on a path and commit to it, you have to commit to just that one, though. It's like, okay, here are, here are seven different possibilities, but to actually achieve, um, you know, liberation, you have to just you have to just do one of them. There's no like, and once you're on that one, there's no you know doing half an hour of the other one or whatever. You just have to stick to it. Is that correct? Right. So, um, which isn't to say that you can't still study other paths, but once you've committed to one, you should just kind of be only doing that one. It's like, um, you know, if you're going to go to a Vipassana course and learn Vipassana meditation, you shouldn't then go and sit in your room and then do mantra meditation. It's a, it's a completely different thing. They're trying to teach you one thing and you're going to go do another like mm -hmm. just do you need to what you need to commit to the path and follow the practices of that sure still learn about other religions and other paths and glean what truths you can from those but in terms of your daily practice that thing that you think that through daily repetition will lead you to transcendence and will produce an ontological change within you yes you just need to stick to one now of course evelyn never chose a path well i mean you you, you say that but he I'm sure at one point in Yoga of Power, he says, listen, you have to keep the secret. Just don't tell anyone. <laughs> like you, like you, once you, once you decide on this, it's important that you don't like make a massive deal of it and go and tell all your friends. And so, I mean, it's possible he did it and just kept the secret, right? As well. Yeah, that is possible. I wouldn't rule uh, it out. So uh, the, the final question in the interest of uh, time here, because our, our big stream is going to be starting at 8 30 which is um some people find Evola very difficult to read at first as we've as we've talked about and even that passage that you've just read out you know like to, to some people is going to sound like what the hell is he talking about do you have any tips on how better to understand him yeah well the way i broke down that paragraph is actually a good example of how i try to read Evola because he's challenging to read no doubt about it and it does take patience but um you know, like all good things, the rewards come with hard work and diligence. So I would say if you're going to undertake to read Evola, then consider making a really deep study of his work. I would say just choose just one book to start with. It doesn't really matter which one book, just as long as it's going it's something that you're genuinely interested in. Um, start and commit to fully understanding it. And even if it takes you a few few years to get through the book, like just take it slow and absorb it. Keep a dictionary handy. Look up the words you don't know. I personally write the definition in the margin of the book so that I don't have to look it up again if I reread it, because oftentimes the words I'm looking up are not words that I ever encounter again anywhere else. Um, so I need the reminder. Um, same with any foreign words or phrases, pop it into a translator app, 
write the phrase in English into the book or, you know, keep a notebook for it if you don't like to write in your books. Um, my books are all pretty heavily marked up, but you can also write your reflections there as well or any questions you have to investigate later. I highly recommend that. Um, some paragraphs you're going to need to read multiple times. Make sure you understand it before you move on. They do often contain crucial points as evidenced in the paragraph that I read. If you didn't understand that, you'd have no idea what he's trying to do in this book. Um, yeah. You know, if you just casually read it and rush through because, you, you know, you're going to miss a lot of nuance. And the main points in, in a, his books are really great, but it's the nuance that makes his ideas electrifying. And you're kind of cheating yourself to miss out on that. And you run the risk of misinterpreting what he's saying and drawing the wrong conclusions. And some of those wrong conclusions could be dangerous to you if you were to act on them. Um, like what we've talked about with some of his yoga of power and introduction to magic. You know, those aren't really books to just kind of casually read or casually try. Um, he's very careful to lay out exactly what he means, but the way he, he does so, it often requires a very careful reading and pausing to think about what he said. So a really great exercise if you wanted to challenge yourself is to take those difficult paragraphs, uh, work to understand them until you could rewrite them in layman's terms for someone. I mean, to be honest, I sometimes need to read a paragraph 10 or 20 times before I get to the point where I could sum it up for a layman. And every chapter of Revolt gets read a minimum of three times before I'm ready to write a script for it, sometimes more. I do the three main readings that I do of a chapter. I do one first reading where I just go through it without stopping to get the gist of it maybe just marking down a few major points that really grab me. The second reading, I make sure that by the end of it, I can make a bullet list of the main points in it and I will underline in there. And then the third is the third reading is where I go for the nuance. And that's where I start making really extensive notes in the margins and making a list of the other materials I need to acquire and read in order to understand it better. So if he references a book in a footnote, I'll try to find that book. If he references a specific tradition that he uses as an example, I'll go look up more details about that practice, assuming I can find some. And obviously, this is a really intensive approach. And I know most people probably won't have the time or inclination to read like this. But for the rare person out there who really wants to become an expert in Evola, or, well, I guess in anything else, because you could certainly read any other book in the way that I'm describing, too. Um, doing it like this would give you a level of mastery that you won't otherwise achieve just by reading casually. And um, of course, if if you are trying to to read Evola and you're struggling with understanding something in one of his books, my DMs on Twitter and Telegram are always open. You know, I'm not an expert like some people out there, but I'll certainly do my best to answer genuine questions or try to point you to where you might be able to find the answer if I don't know it. And there's loads of Facebook groups, Discord channels, stuff like that, um, that can also be really good resources also when you have questions. So that's my that's my advice for getting through your first Evola book. Yeah, the, the, one thing I will say is that um, I think people have a lot of uh, images of what they think of when you talk when you say the word spiritual, right? Mm -hmm. um, immediately, your mind goes to like you know the Beatles going to India, New Age, you know, crystal balls, and I I, I would say um, it's important to clear your mind of any of those preconceptions because. One of the things that I've come to understand is that, you know, certainly in Evola's way of doing things, you're never kind of like losing yourself in that sort of way. There's no like, you know, drugs or mind altering substances or, um, you know, it's all about self-control and mastery, fully conscious all the time, um, mm -hmm. unless I've misunderstood something. Um, and in, in, a, in a strange way, he almost like demystifies it. Uh, from a lot of that kind of, you know, people talk about the woo, right? But mm -hmm. really, it's very not unwoo like. That's what I found uh, in a lot. It of is, it. yeah. Which is why this was another reason why I like it because I always was put off by, you know, I, I shouldn't say anything bad about them. I do have, I do have, you know, kind of new agey friends, and I love them dearly, but. The woo woo drives me nuts. And it's just like, can we actually talk about this with some academic seriousness and not just your emotions about it? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but I, I think they said there's a deeper point there because people default to what they imagine those things are. And in that book that we talked about, the, the mask in the face, he unpacks like, you know, the return to nature is one of the things that people yeah. default to thinking. And he kind of, 
you know, he deconstructs that and almost like demolishes that idea in that in that book. Um, and uh, you know, so really, if you're gonna, you should do what he he says rather than what you imagine spirituality to be, which is a lot of these kind of false ideas, I guess. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a it's a great book for people to read if they want to understand better um, what his view of spirituality is. And as you said, it's been published under a new name now, The Fall of Spirituality, which I kind of hate. I liked the original name yeah, a lot the mask better. Yeah, the face is so cool, you know. But yeah, I, just it's a much more engaging title. Yeah. yeah, I assume there must have been. But um, yeah, I'd maybe, maybe list that one in, in my hidden gems as well. Um, there's actually quite a few I could have put in there, I suppose. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a weird chapter in there on Satanism. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, he covers actually, everything like, in that. Yeah. He's, he really just goes through all these different traditions where he's like, this is why they're not real spirituality. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's too big. We're, I'm going to have to wrap this up now. But um, there's also a chapter on Catholicism in there where he's mm -hmm. not as, like, scathing as you imagine he might be because he's famous for not liking Catholicism, right? But um, he kind Catholicism of has a bit more... probably got, like, the nicest treatment of anything in that book. Yeah. All, all right. Is is um, Where can people find you if they want to you know, watch more of your stuff or get in touch with you? Or... Well, they can find me on YouTube, Philosophicat, spelled just the way it is on your screen. Um, I'm also on Twitter and Telegram under the same name. Um, and that's kind of where I post the most. So Great. Well, thank you. Very oh, and I'm also, I'm also on Odyssey, I think, too, because I know some people don't like YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm on Odyssey as well. I just forget to say. Yeah. Although, but people who are watching this, I guess they like YouTube. So, yeah, yeah go sub to my channel. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much for that. hope people are enjoying uh, Evola Day. Just one more show left for the day, which is our grand stream on his life and works, which is coming up next. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for including me. I'm looking forward to it.